Hello, everybody. Um, this is the weekly meeting for uh, Project Kubert. I'm your host, Chris Caligari, and um, let's begin. Okay, share my screen now. I'm glad to see uh, folks uh, filling out the attendees. Um, oh, we have a we have a couple new people. Um, feel free to introduce yourself now. Hi, I'm Dominic Collo. I moved internally to Re in Red Hat, new to the C to the Red Hat part of the Kubernetes project. Hi. Welcome, Dominic. And do we have anybody else that would like to say hello? No? Okay. Um, let's get Rachel. into. Did somebody say something? Okay. Um, let's get into the agenda. Then um, Daniel has the first bullet point. Hi everyone, just a quick heads up. I hope everyone can hear me by the way. Um, we are going to rename the default branches to main for the repositories Kubebird and Project Infra. We're planning to do this on Friday. Um, before we are starting this, we will of course um, also give another heads up to the Kubebird dev mailing list. Um, just uh, just as a heads up that, that this should happen on Friday, this Friday. Sounds good. Thank you for that notice, Daniel. Um, could you also help us with user guide and uh, kubert.github.io? Yeah, sure. Um, I think you yes. are talking about what uh, John Hur is uh, trying to tackle, right? Yes. I've uh, contacted him and uh, first I've written with him and, and uh, we made, or, or I explained to him my strategy about uh, how to rename branches. And, but I think he's, on, on, uh, he's out this week, I think. And, yes, and, he is. And I figure we will, we will tackle this next week. Okay. At some point in next week. Great, appreciate that. Um, just so you know, uh, kubert.github.io still uses Travis CI um, as our, as our uh, merge strategy. So I'm working hard to get, uh, to get that switched over to, to Prow this week. So you yeah. should see some uh, pull requests into Project Infra. Yeah, sure. I'll have a look when, when just ping you on that PR and, and then I'll have a look at that. Great, thank you. Okay, anything else on that topic? Then moving on to Ryan, take her away. Hey, um, so this is a, an issue I posted on the, on the mailing list uh, last week and we even talked about it last Thursday in six scale. Um, this issue is kind of interesting. There's, um, uh, if, you, if you do want to open it up, Chris, and sure. just to give folks a flavor of what's, there, there's um, in releases other than or less than zero four zero. There's um, the vert handler creates um, a ton of of uh, list API requests, uh, and you don't actually see it until you reach large amounts of scale. Um, I'm still working on exactly what the numbers are because uh, it kind of varies from what I'm seeing for different releases. Um, and, and I can talk about that probably more in, in the six scale next Thursday when I get the numbers. But basically what happens is Vert Handler creates tons and tons of these list requests and you hit like 700, 800, 900 VMs in a zone or in a data center or whatever. And eventually the list requests add up, they overwhelm the API server and the, um, the latency goes from milliseconds to uh, almost a minute uh, fairly quickly. And this issue was spotted and, and there is a, a pull request that was merged um, in March, that's, that's listed there. And uh, it, it's, it's um, from what I've seen testing so far, it's uh, solving the issue. 
um, it's hard to tell how how much um, scale this sort of adds. Um, considering that different releases uh, are affected differently, there could also be other issues at play. But it, so far, this it, this issue does look good. So the reason I wanted to bring it up is uh, uh, is because if you are using um, and a release that's less than 0 040, um, your scale, uh, I mean, it's roughly like 600, 700 VMs is right now, right around the limit where you'll start to see this. And, um, and basically every time you do a get request, you'll notice how long it takes for you to get any sort of list of uh, VMIs back. And this was when Prometheus was used, right? So you'd hit this, yeah. okay. I, I think the concerning thing to me is um, you know it's pretty bad that this got introduced and it's great that it got fixed and it's great that we know what happened, but we don't have any sort of mechanism to protect us from this in the future. Any sort of auditing of the API calls that we make uh, and seeing when an increase occurs, it just kind of we just find out whoever's testing this in production. So I've been thinking about that a lot lately. How we can begin auditing in our CI test suite. Uh, what API calls we make and be able to detect these kinds of fluctuations. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, one thing that I was thinking about with this issue is that it's actually um, with the test sort of the framework that we can kind of think of here that we can test in CI, this would actually be really valuable in that we actually have uh, something that we can reproduce. Like if we were to go back, we should, we should be able to detect, protect, detect this precisely, like the, and figure out like a number of things, like what the latency is, the precise scale, like the tool that we want to come up with that measures this stuff, we can actually um, use this issue to to kind of gauge its success. Um, so that that's something that I sort of I see as a silver lining for this that we could um, that we could use to to measure in the future. But yeah, I mean, I totally agree, David. Like, um, it would be good to have and per commit, per release, whatever we we want to know, like what these numbers are, the, both the scale numbers and as well as the performance numbers. I think we could make a even a pre-submit to catch. Uh, well, I think there's several layers to this. It's possible we can we can even create a pre-submit. But uh, for example, let's create 20 virtual machines in CI mm -hmm. as pre-submit, and we expect uh, this type of outcome. Uh, you know, give or take a little bit. Like maybe we'll two yeah. x even. And if we get like five x API recalls uh, in the, during that creation period, then fail it and say, hey, this needs to be investigated. Uh, what's occurring here. Or if, if new API calls get introduced uh, regarding our API that weren't expected to occur during this, that would be another signal that something is uh, amiss. Yep. Yeah, definitely. There's like, yeah, this is just one, like this is this is list. There's more to this. And, and this is just something that, that we've seen on our side with um, some of our production systems is that like the update call gets called a ton. Like when we're at large scale, there's a lot of update calls that happen. Um, and, and so like VM VMIs are being updated and um, they're in running state and, and they're just, there's a lot of calls. And eventually like when they're, when you reach a certain scale, etcd calls, uh, the, the calls eventually, you know, the update the objects get to etcd, etcd has to compress the data. And eventually, it, you know, that costs a lot of CPU and, memory and watch watches get closed and things happen and, and it, it does limit things so there's so i completely agree like we we, we look at this for all the apis and we kind of get a metric on this and and but this is just one that we can start with and um yeah finding a tool to make it work it would definitely make a lot of sense i'll try to follow up on this a little bit uh, i think I, I have an idea of how to begin auditing the stuff because uh we have in the cube Kubernetes config, like the, the, the data structure we use to create our clients, there's a way to hook in to uh, the round tripper so we can mm -hmm. inject some tracing logic there and begin auditing it that way. Yeah, okay, that sounds cool. Yeah, like basically the the, the way I've observed this was like just looking at the, the Prometheus, or look, just actually looking at the Prometheus data and then building a um, something in Grafana that, uh, that scrapes the endpoints based on what uh, endpoints that that cube exposes on the API server. So yeah, if, if there's something we can hook into pro or programmatically, yeah, that'd be awesome. Cool. Okay, I'll update the, so what I'll do is like with this issue, um, um, well, actually that, that's actually another thing I want to ask. So this, this issue, so um, in, 
uh, less than zero for zero, um, anything that 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 is using the Prometheus will be affected. Um, what I'll what I'll do is like I want to get the numbers roughly per like a few of the releases, like you know, get a general gauge for the scale, and I'll post them on the mailing list so folks are aware. Do we want to like? Is this some issue that we ever want to consider um, backporting, or is this something that like um, we should just inform folks about and um, you know backport them... it? Backport it, certainly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. I can do that. I'll take that action item. Okay. Yep. That's all I have. Thanks, everybody. Do we have a, a policy or anything in place on how far we backport, David? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's pretty loose. Uh, we do have a formal policy. The formal policy is essentially, uh, you can backport a bug fix as far back or anything that falls under our, our um, backport policy, like what criteria that has to be met in order to backport. You can backport as far back as you want as long as CI still runs. Uh, so if CI okay. is running and we can validate that it worked, then good. Okay, there you have it, Ryan. Backport to uh, 20, 30 different versions. Good. Yeah. I'll see how far I can go. <laughs> 36 versions. I have no idea how. Eventually it's going to stop working. CI will be. I'm yeah, yeah, David yeah. having to uh, approve those pull requests. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, end of the agenda, unless anybody has something else. We can move on to thoughts on snapshot, create, restore, and upload them to CDI. Or uh, container images. So this container is, images, I, I'll summarize my thought here. And this is pretty loose. It came up in an internal discussion at my company and uh, thought it was interesting. It's kind of been thrown around a few times. I, I think I, yeah, I pulled some storage people on the call. What would people think about the ability to snapshot a virtual machine, um, upload that as a container image, um, not necessarily talking about a container disk, I'm talking about a container image that contains like the disks as well as the VM spec and any other sort of metadata or whatever associated with that VM. And then be able to restore from that container image. So it's almost like we're using containers, the packaging and delivery of snapshots. Um, what, is that a crazy thought? Would anyone find that useful? Or uh, actually, I, I yeah. this just came up recently, and I really like this idea. Uh, something that my mind immediately extended this with is, uh, well, if it's in a container, then you can use Scopio and move it around and potentially to an offline cluster. That, and you can begin versioning it. Ver I mean, you, you naturally get versioning just with container tags and things like that. Um, it's pretty portable once you get into a container image. And it could help with disaster recovery? Possibly uh, somebody, I mean, I don't, I don't know how, I know that uh, the storage team was looking at Valero. Um, yeah. That's kind of like a production um, standard for a lot of people. Uh, so maybe in some cases, people might consider this for disaster recovery. Um, so, so yeah, it definitely with... seems similar. Um, whereas, you know, Valero backs up your resources to um, like an object store, like, you know, S3 or something. Uh, this will just use the container registry. Seems like the big... Um, kind of theoretical difference. Expanding this idea to some what maybe crazy mind game, if that combined with our PVC auto update, you could use a snapshot as a source for uh, an auto updating source again. Yeah, I see that. You, you pretty much make like a cycle out of that. So you have a build pipeline that's creating snapshots, uploading them as containers. And then uh, that using them back in. Yeah. 
uh, that that's probably <laughs> that we might have been taken. That might be a step too far for this discussion. But yeah, it makes sense. And uh, David, we have a hook into the virtual machine to quiesce memory. So we're working on that now. Um, implementing well. So we're implementing right currently uh, FS freeze implementation for snapshots. So we'll um, get the file systems consistent. Uh, we haven't uh, started working on like dumping um, memory yet or including that in snapshots. Um, so we're gonna be have more synchronization soon. Oh, yeah. Would it be full machine snapshots, like including memory, David, or do you did you only oh, think about like oh, the disk snapshot? Uh, so I'm talking about snapshots in their entirety. So right now we have offline okay, yeah. snapshots. Uh, we're working on crash consistent. Maybe do crash? Maybe they already exist. So we have online snapshots now. They're just not. Okay. Uh, they're not integrated with our guest agent in FS freeze yet. So crass consistent is what we call that or yellow. Yeah, yeah, okay. yep, yep, yep. Okay. Uh, and I guess the last phase there is the online snapshot with FS freeze. Yep. And then then after that is <laughs> well and so the next step after the FS freeze implementation will be dumping memory for online snapshots. Right. And that was going to be done to uh, a PVC I suppose. Yeah, so yeah, know. yeah. Yeah, that was the proposal, right, that, that we talked about with the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I think so, for this case where disaster recovery, I'm, you know, I'm not sure that the memory dump is going to be that important. I, To be honest, I don't think snapshots are that important. <laughs> but uh, because, all right, I, I got to tell you what my, my uh, work history is. Um, I was at, with uh, Hewlett Packard Global Services and their uh, data archiving service. So uh, when, uh, when, we t when we talk about doing backups, like I immediately think of like um, data archiving for an entire data center and like at the petabyte range. So, um, when you when you get down into the individual virtual machine, like in today's day and age, there's an expectation that you have uh, a solid uh, deployment process. You have a configuration management um, mechanism of some sort, and then basically uh, you should be able to to bring up your your app from from ground zero within seconds or a few minutes. And then it's a matter of restoring data, restoring your your data sources, and uh, so like when you're when you think about the the backup of an individual virtual machine, like why like <laughs> when well, you have so this entire uh, this entire uh, production process to to build out uh, virtual machines. There's more use cases than that. So I, I see what you're getting at. If you're coming at it from that angle, snapshots uh, may hold less value. But think about the scenario where somebody's building their own, um, like an AWS, for example. Uh, sometimes people take a AMI, uh, just a standard image off the marketplace. Let's say they take a CentOS 8 um, image, and they want to build an application inside of that image, mm -hmm. and then essentially snapshot that, and then make like a thousand copies of it. So they, they want to do a... the process of injecting their application into this uh, standard image and- uh, So they have a golden, it's the golden image process. Kind of, yeah. You could but think don't of we like have that. that already? Don't we have that capability already from the, the PV, PVC layer? Not the creation from a running VM. That's more complicated. Okay. And another part on the snapshot thing, like, you, you're right, but there is also more and more workloads that are like in memory workloads. And if you have proper, disk, like if you have a disaster and you want to recover um, and you have a lot of in-memory workloads, you might want to have memory snapshots because it can take longer to rebuild all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, there. Yeah, but, I yeah. mean, it's the that's, whole, that's the memory it's the whole pets versus, 
pets first cattle. I mean, there there yeah. are going to definitely be cases where you have, um, you know, especially with virtual machines uh, that are special. <laughs> and, uh, but I think for your, probably what suits your history is like the, you know, Valero backup, which is a real enterprise disaster recovery thing um, that is really, works best at backing up your whole namespace or backing up a whole um, set of uh, machines and restoring a whole big set. So I think this is more, the more bespoke uh, use case. Yeah, so whenever have... you talk to an Oracle DBA, they really don't want you backing up the operating system instance. They would rather spend time exporting um, Oracle data than, you know, they uh, they have their installation mechanism and they don't like to try and bother with uh, restoring of the of the installation of the binary files. Maybe regardless of what we think about snapshots, they uh, they exist and they're going to continue to be developed on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe with or without our um, agreeing that they are the most useful uh, mechanism for different things. Uh, so going back to the original thought, if we have snapshots, are we, if we back these things up to container images, are we just inventing something that's clever or are, is there value here? That's what I'm trying to determine. Is this something that's worth pursuing or is it, something that would just be, oh, that's neat, the way would ever use. For me, it depends on if I can use a container image like that to start a virtual machine again, like, or if I need, like, if it contains everything to be a container disk that I can use to create a new VM, and then sure. yes. Okay, maybe I should flesh this out a little bit more and take it to the mailing list. So one other real quick thought on that. Um, I've been working with some people who've been using Kubevert and for various reasons, they've been rebuilding their clusters a lot. And each time they would sort of get a virtual machine that was running um, and then they'd have to rebuild their cluster and um, you know complete wipe, start over. Um, and there's no real way to just simply export a virtual machine or a, a, a VM that's been um, defined inside um, Kubevert. So the other thing that would be really interesting, um, you know, I had actually taken a quick look at the CDI importer to see if there was a way to flip that on its head and use it as an exporter as well. The same type of workflow where instead of doing a, um, you know, vert CTL, um, you know, upload image to kind of import um, something into a PVC, use that same type of concept to spit one back out again. Um, and then, you know, once you had it spit out, then you could obviously use it to re-upload it in, um, you know, and, and re-import that same image again in. Um, it's not quite as um, uh, fancy as what you're talking about as far as using the um, container images. I think there's a real value there too, but just having the ability to, um, you know, do a simple export of a virtual machine image um, possibly from the vert control um, tool, I think would be very powerful or very useful as well. So I think the container image part is just a uh, delivery mechanism. So it's just a place that we all have when we're talking about like Kubernetes deployments to store and retrieve data. If we had an object store that was external to the cluster, that would make sense. It's just something that exists everywhere. That's the only reason why I, I was considering it. Yeah, I mean, definitely when working with containers, the registry makes a lot of sense. And I think, yeah, maybe we should come up with like a standard format for, I, I do, and this is an idea we picked around a bit is with the vert control export, but like come up with the standard format for exporting a VM and then um, have ways to um, upload that to different um, endpoints. And, and yeah, registry seems like a natural first bit. Yeah, I, I, I think there is a standard for like exporting. I don't know how much of a standard it really is, but it's like the OVS or um, OVF 
you know, ideally, um, that would be the way to go if we were going to do something that was a full export. Um, that's kind of a standards based thing. Um, I think that would be the, the, the way to look and see whether or not um, that could be done. Um, so I see that it's called the OVF open virtualization format. Yes, that's we were talking I'm... about that a little bit earlier uh, at my company and it's a standard kind of it sounds like it's a like a loose standard to the point where none of the like if, okay if i uh, back something up in the ovf standard uh it's not necessarily going to be able to be restored by anything that can restore the ovf it, it's like platform specific still so if i back up something uh ovf on um Qvert and try to restore it on overt that, that's not going to work probably unless we're like really careful about how we do it uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. It's it's sort of a, a, a wishy-washy format, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, but I figured I would just mention it as, you know, um, a possibility. Um, at least there's something out there that we could try to, to work towards. Again, to your point, it's it definitely is kind of a, um, a, a non-standard standard. Since it's a non-standard standard, do we... I guess I'm trying to understand the value of it then. Uh, like what's the value of us um, using this standard rather than coming up with something that's natural for Qvert? Uh, I, I, I guess I'm thinking about it from the way uh, perspective of um, why not take the easiest and simplest path forward for us than try to fit within a standard that doesn't have any value. The, or maybe it does have value. Yep. The only the only thought there would be, um, you know, some applications um, and some vendors will distribute um, a virtual application as an OVF or an OVA, um, and so being able to import those um, might be useful. Um, and so that was where the thought of you know if we're going to be able if, if it was something that we could import, then being able to export it as well, there might be some value there. Okay. Yeah, I, we've kicked around. This is another thing. I think that uh, importing OVA has come up. Um, one, one more thought. Um, I think I, uh, Stu brought this up in a mail or something, but this could also play together with the, the su suggested idea of exporting or storing virtual machines in the container itself, like the VMI definition. So if you can do a full dump that contains a snapshot and the configuration, and we have this way uh, of loading it all from just one container image, then that would be like repackaging a full virtual machine included everything with this snapshot mechanism. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, I've heard that there are ways you can like, in a container, there are labels or annotations or something where we could stuff uh, VM YAML or something some very similar. Stuff that is it could a file. Just be a file inside yeah. the manifest too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if yes, yeah. I I have just a question. If we start using container images for a snapshot. Um, so container images, at least on Kubernetes, are not namespace. So could that be an issue? If you create a snapshot and then it's available to all the user on that node? That's yeah, a very so good point. It would be <laughs> namespaced. Yeah, very fair point. Well, the, the it depends on the use case. If if it's for security, that would cause all sorts of consternation. If 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 you actually wanted to move namespaces, that'd be pretty convenient. Um, but I imagine the what would be on the table would be actually putting the entire manifest of the VM into the uh, container. So 
for instance, the namespace would be saved there if you were attempting to restore. But you, you're very correct about this being suddenly globally visible. I mean, in a um, shift there are something like image stream and you can define those for namespace, but that's not true for, for uh, native Kubernetes. I mean, naked Kubernetes. So yeah, something to consider. Just... Do we currently support the like, encryption of virtual machines and, and would the snapshots be encrypted the same way? So they would be at least secure from somebody just saying, hey, I used a snapshot that this other person created. Is that? Wouldn't that be at the application layer? Yeah, kind of. You, yeah. you encrypt yeah. your desk or not? Yeah, right. I did work with some uh, locks based encrypt file system encryption and um, it works and uh, it works as expected. You have to console into the virtual machine and enter your password at the very basic configuration. So if you take a snapshot of that, you I probably expect uh, the same behavior from a virtual machine based on that snapshot. Okay, I, I'll take this with me for a little bit and I'll, I'll try to write something up a little bit more crisp on the mailing list. Uh, I think I'm gonna restructure this instead of talking about snapshots, talk about um, import and export of virtual machines to container images and uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. Uh, does anyone um, else have anything else to add before we? Yeah, one, one quick note on the globally visible, like the snapshot would only be visible on the node that it's sent to, all right, it, it's, it's not, always globally visible. It's like if you limit your namespace to a certain set of nodes, only people on the same nodes could read the snapshot, I think. So, but it's still, uh, yeah. Okay. Let's see, how do I word that? Maybe that's kind of abstracted away. If we're talking about uploading to a container registry, then yeah. the security of the container registry was visible there. Like it's the same thing as any other uh, exporting to any other um, data store of some sort. You're, you have to be aware of where you're exporting something and where it's visible. Um, so I don't know if trying to carry maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but trying to carry the same uh, visibility of what was visible for this virtual machine in the cluster, like namespace wise, and carrying that into an external data store. I don't know if that's practical. No, 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 that's, uh, no, I didn't mean that. It, just that visibility is, is not, everybody just, uh, the ones that have access to the registry or the node where it was pulled or pushed. Oh, I see what you're saying again. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right, so we'd be caching it. Yeah. Are you guys happy with the, the wording to this bullet point here? I would yeah, just feel free to snapshot. feel free to update if uh I would just replace snapshot with images, but um, okay. it looks pretty nice. Yeah. Good thoughts, everyone. All right. Um just another general thought. Um, what does the, the snapshot uh, include? I mean, could it couldn't it be uh, too big for a container? Yeah, it depends on the location. I think I'm trying to remember some registry, there was limits to like how many gigabytes you can throw into a container registry. And I don't know, I feel like they got lifted in a few places. I don't remember all the details there. Does anyone else remember the details and the limits that we have for container images? I don't know about us, I don't know about Quay, but I've pushed more than 100 gigabytes into Google Container Registry, but that's kind of just more expensive, so they don't limit you, I guess. I think that uh, there was a technical limitation on the client side, uh, oh. and I think that that's gone now, because we hit that with our CI, our Qbert CI, because we're 
we're packaging up our CI um, node images that are used for building our like, Kubernetes clusters that we run CI and container images. And we actually hit some sort of limit. This is back in like 2017 at around 20 gigabytes, I think. I don't think it exists anymore though, uh, because it kind of magically disappeared at one point. I can't remember the details there. <laughs> Yeah, at uh, Credit Suisse Bank, we used to have a 20 gig RPM for installing Oracle. It was quite something to see. <laughs> okay, uh, are we about all done with this uh, topic then? Do we have everything that we want to say about it? I'm good. Good discussion. Thank you. Thanks, David. And thank you again for uh, hosting the, the deep dive into Kubert with uh, Siam yesterday. Uh, it was quite awesome. Um, the, I attached a link to the, the video archive for uh, those that, that missed the live stream yesterday. And uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up in chat also. Um, I saw a couple folks there and uh, even Dan K showed up. So that was really neat to see him present. Yeah, just for future, um, I didn't realize how helpful it was to have community members in the chat for these types of events because it's very intimidating to be trying to pay attention to you know the conversation and everything and then keeping up with the chat at the same time. I'm just seeing things fly down on the chat. And then I started seeing community members answer questions. It was like a relief. So thank you all for joining. And uh, we need to, um, in the future, make sure that we're, maybe we're even intentional about backing each other up. I mean, I'm really glad everyone came out. Uh, I want to make sure nobody uh, in the future gets stuck in a situation where they don't have support. Um, because it was so helpful. Yeah, we uh, we totally missed that in the planning. Um, and I, I was going to be present anyways. Uh, and uh, um, I actually missed uh, Siam's invitation to the live stream. He wanted to get me up there. And uh, I'm, actually, I'm actually really glad that you, that you uh, volunteered to take it over, David, because despite, uh, despite, <laughs> everything i'm not a very good public speaker and uh i can get up there and become a deer in the headlights and just not know what to do and lose lose my thoughts um but you got up there and uh i was hanging out in chat and all of a sudden i saw the the chat start moving uh pretty quick with questions and just jumped right in there and of course others were there also and, and helped out with that well thank was, you i appreciate it i thought it went mm -hmm. well I did too. Can't wait to do the next one. We should have hope. I, I, really, I, I'm excited about doing a, a, another Kubert Summit. Um, that worked out so awesome. So uh, uh, Josh and I have been talking about um, what we want to do for the next summit. Are we thinking that will be an annual thing? So we'll do it once a year? Um, we were talking about uh, doing it more often, but we didn't want to, uh, we didn't want to overburden everybody and, and uh, like dilute the, uh, the momentum. Like we just had a Red Hat Summit just got split up into two different parts. And uh, it's actually going on right now. Uh, yesterday was the first day of part two. And attendance was miserable it's so we we lost uh the event lost a lot of momentum from um uh, the from part one last month uh, there's probably going to be some fallout um, okay well that's a good data point i, I think it also makes sense that we, we don't want to be a summit planner right now <laughs> yeah uh consider an annual thing because that gives everybody a single target and i think we'll get better attendance if yeah we get yeah the, the, atten the attendance to to Coover summit was really good um we were all uh, surprised at the turnout and even the the number of uh, of submitted papers was surprising and 
we had to create a committee to review all the papers and had to turn some down even. We didn't expect that. So uh, lots more to talk about um, in the near future. And of course we have uh, the All Things Open demo being built out right now. And again, if you wanna volunteer for that, um, please let me know. Uh, we're building out uh, an internet distributed uh, Kubernetes cluster running Kubert on Raspberry Pi. So that's, uh, that's pretty cutting edge for us. Um, I'm, uh, I'm passionate about supercomputing con, so I'm going to be driving that one. Um, there's a, I have a colleague at, at NASA that is present at this uh, convention, so I wanted to uh, try and hook him into using Kubert. So I do have some, uh, some intentions there and it will be the first time I'll, I'll ever have swayed his technical uh, decision making in like the 15 years I've known him. <laughs> and if anybody has any other uh, event su suggestions, please let me know. Uh, oh, uh, KubeCon NA and um, uh, KVM Forum. Um, we still have, haven't heard any word back about whether or not our papers have been accepted. That is all I have for events. And Daniel has another bullet point with REST API coverage. Yeah, actually, I forgot about that. I would have uh, done it otherwise in the, uh, put it in, into the agenda, but yeah. Um, just a quick heads up that we have now basic REST API coverage available. It's still kind of preview. So no filtering on uh, unnecessary API calls or something. Um, we need to improve on that, of course. But yeah, if, if someone wants to have a look at that, we, there is a tool uh, that is used uh, to create the coverage from the Kubernetes audit logs using the open API definition. Um, and um, then it generates the API coverage report, which is just a JSON file. Um, and, and the Prowl lens uh, displays that if, if you want to just a quick um, click at the uh, example link, then, then you can just see what, what I mean with that. Um, maybe, uh, Chris? Oh, sure. No, the, the example oh, link. Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. That's good. Just uh, so that you see um, how that looks. There is the REST API coverage report at the top of the page. You see it. At the moment, it's 8.58%, uh, which is, of course, a great, like, like I said, the filtering still misses. Um, and if you can, you can uh, expand the details um, on the right of the REST API coverage report. Um, please scroll back up, uh, Chris. Thank you. And then you see uh, where the REST API coverage report is. There you can click on the details, and then you see the, the detailed uh, report, what uh, URLs and what combinations of, of um, verbs and, and uh, fields uh, were hit. So yeah, that's just a quick heads up so that everyone knows that we have this. Uh, the report needs to get triggered manually at the moment, uh, which also you can, you can see how we do that at, at the uh, PR. Um, and um, yeah, it's not, not uh, on by default, but um, yeah, we work, we're still working on that. Thanks. Great, thank you, Daniel. Okay, we have some uh, pull requests that need attention. 
Okay, this is from me. Um, so actually, I have a specific problem to this PR and that I would love to have some feedback. So um, basically, I'm adding a new command uh, to VRCTL. And this command is deploying a container image. So I would like to avoid to hard code um, the registry and the tag of this image. So in the first version of this PR, I actually was getting the registry and some other information from Qvert uh, CRD. Uh, the problem is that regular user cannot get QVR CRD. So what I did, I added a new um, CRD that holds uh, the image information. Um, so, but that's of course introduced a new CRD in QVR. So I would like to ask you if this is fine for you or if you have any other suggestions. If, if I remember this correctly, you want to create a, a part directly with word couple, right? Yes. And, and therefore you don't have that information. I yeah. guess you could get the tag or version pretty easily, like word couple version gets the information, but then we don't export the registry or anything. Yeah. Um, the problem is, I mean, there is a, a flag where you can override uh, the, the image. Um, the thing is, uh, maybe you release new images uh, more often than the RCTL version. So, yeah, the tag you could get. Uh, we have an endpoint where we export the version. So, if you do root cattle version, you get the, the server version from Kubert. So there you could get the tag from. That's a part that's public readable, but we mm -hmm. don't expose their the registry. Okay. Where it's coming from. Yeah. And, uh, um, I mean, we I already. Hard... Sorry. Cool. You know, I, I want to say we, we already defined registry on, on, on build and use it for pulling out of stuff. So I, I, I myself wouldn't mind if it is the hard coded thing that was decided at, on, at build time and you can override it, but I. So we could go with, I mean, yeah. So we could go with full hard coding on compile time, the tag, which we know from the release and the registry and you can just override it, right? That's that one possibility, Kevin. Or we could say yeah. we just hard code, code the registry and the tag would be determined on the vertical version rest endpoint. That would be my it. favorite, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I can hard code Quay and that's, I think, the standard registry where we push the images. And then if somebody yeah. wants to use a, spe a special image, it can always override. So, okay. you don't... so you would like to avoid a new CRD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and for... you don't have to hard code Quay. You can hard code, to, uh, I think it's called Docker registry environment variable that gets set at build. Um, yeah, but yeah. Roman, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm That's building so... VRCTL. Mm, yeah, we have some. The, I would love to, to get the information from the cluster. Yeah. That's why I, I did uh, this, uh, this uh, CRD. Mm. I would still recommend that, uh, like Kevin said, uh, take the Docker registry and variable during build time mm -hmm. and read the tag dynamically via, via the endpoint with which the word couple version command uses. Okay. Um, we, we can think about improving it even further later but I think that unblocks you and makes the feature yeah. available. Okay. I mean, version could also provide the registry it pulls from. I don't know if that's um, something we want to do. What was that, Vert? Vertcuttle version. Ah. It calls, 
it brings you the vert cuttle version, but also calls the calls uh, vert API to get the server version, and that's just something you could use. Got it. I think I think I captured all the pertinent notes here. Yeah, I, I will have a note. Thank you. That was put simple. So. Great. Thanks, Alice. Um, you're moving along pretty nicely on that one. Okay. Kevin, for Cuddle, yeah, um, SSH. Yeah, me again with SSH. Um, I just want to get more, give, like, more feedback from the community about this uh, discussion we have. Um, I'm, I'm building a virtual CTL uh, SSH command, and up until yesterday, I think, um, I was wrapping the locally available SSH client um, and uh, using that for establishing the final SSH connection. And Roman very validly uh, mentioned that we should have a, a go native SSH command. Um, but I, I, I implemented that and it's very basic right now. Like it doesn't read your SSH config. It doesn't talk to an agent yet. Uh, Right now, it only supports password. I'm adding a uh, public key. And my question is like, what we think should be the default if a user just wants to SSH into VM, do they want the most basic SSH that just works? Or do they want to use their local SSH with their public key, private key agent stuff? I think both are valuable in general. I like what yeah. you had in the pull request regarding to the uh, a proxy command so that yeah. you can just uh, use uh, basically a virtual port forward or I don't know I didn't check what you changed where where you can use that in your cube config as proxy command and it for instance mm -hmm. with a star and it would send all, everything correctly through to the red toast um, for the SSH agent uh, yeah and uh, what I also like about uh, the port forward is that you can use any SSH client then instead of wrapping one specific one, and it's pretty clear what you're doing. Yeah. Regarding to built in one, I wouldn't suggest that if Go wouldn't have such a great SSH library, I should see this as an opportunity yeah. this way yeah. because it's cross platform and there's also this SSH config library, which is not from the Go developers, but which. Yeah, look at that. It didn't look. Uh, maybe I looked at a different one, but it looked didn't look so fleshed out. Or I, I, I don't know if I wanted to add the dependency. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, I, yeah, I still have the goal of publishing a virt CTL image that just contains a binary, so you can use virt CTL in your cluster. And then SSH wouldn't work if it wrapped mm -hmm. open SSH because that's not there. Um, so yeah, I like that. What I would um, at least expect from in the first iteration of the basic client would be elliptic curve, RSA, and not, not even necessarily the agent. Yeah. But password um, and the two. Yeah. So I would still go for adding a port forward command. That's what I'm working on right now. Mm -hmm. And keep the SSH. And right now I have um, the default on the Go client and a flag called local SSH, I think, right now that does what it did, does it right now on, on my PR wrapping. Mm -hmm. Existing SSH yeah. with port forward uh, proxy command. Yeah, maybe we can. Yeah. Maybe we can iterate a little bit on how you pass in what that you want to use this. Yeah. Yeah. On the flag, but generally fine by me. Um, Has anybody else have, have like thoughts on what they would prefer or how they want to use it? I think this looks pretty cool. And uh, I just think back of uh, all those environments that we've we've all been working in with these massive uh, jump boxes. It would be great to get rid of a, a box like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, something I, I still have to add to the docs or something um, that Roman and I talked about in private was like this is great for getting access to a VM, but if you are in an environment where, where there's a lot of SSH traffic and it's like your primary traffic to VMs, 
you might still want a solution that is not this because it still goes over the API server. It's just um, the traffic you put on there, you put on the control plane, and that's not always what you want. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think for 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 even for for middle sized deployment scenarios where you're using Ansible, it's still fine to use use the one which you're implementing right now. Yeah, because they're normally just send control commands over SSH, and the actual work is happening differently. Yeah, but if if you're making exclusive use of SCP or whatever, and have a lot of clients or so on, or if you and we had these cases too, if you wanna. Uh, separate your automation tool, uh, so your deployment tools uh, from the Kubernetes API, then you need a different solution. Yeah. I think I tested it with uh, 10,000, 5,000, 10,000 open connections, and there was some impacts on the CPU, but it was acceptable. Huh. So, but I would still not recommend people to, like, I don't know, use that as the main access to the original mm -hmm. machine if they. Well, in another couple of years, when we're all on thread rippers, we won't have a CPU problem. But if you really <laughs> just use it for that, we think. Yeah. We'll brute think force it. <laughs> if you're just using it for lightweight things like Ansible still, I would consider it. Yeah. I think it's great because what, what you avoid with that is that you are really exposing an SSH entry point to your cluster at all, uh, at all which is mm. kind of, so at least not where your workload connections are coming in and going out. You can completely separate basically your control connections from workload connections and don't expose them. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely easier. I had some trouble getting into uh, my virtual machines via SSH when I first started with Kubert. So even with the basic functionality, it looks much easier to deal with. So looking good, Kevin. Yeah, I think what that's, that's first? all I wanted to discuss. And not only okay. me, it's been around for a bit. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, that takes us to 8 a.m. And uh, we uh, ran out of time for mailing list review and bug scrub. Um, I put a link in here for uh, for issues that are not labeled. So whoever wants to run it next time um, will have an easy link. So it seems like we always have a little hitch on who wants to do the bug scrub. And we had a nice bug scrub last week. So I say we are in good shape to skip this week. Oh, great. Because <laughs> <laughs> lots of <laughs> sighs of relief here. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll end the meeting and uh, we will see you all next week or um, talk to you on the mailing list. Or... Sound good? See you, everybody. All right. Have a good week. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.